Could you describe the, the period at the GCA? What, what was the development program like that then eventually became, became a stepper? Well, the, the first project I got put on was actually a thing called a pattern generator. And uh, we, my boss, Bert Wheeler, had thought that up. And the idea was to take computer-generated design data, which we thought was out there, and we built a little machine that would generate the mask and eliminate the big, I was glad to see a picture of a reduction camera. Uh, most people here may remember what that looked like, but I'd forgotten, more or less. Uh, it replaced the reduction camera because the, the ruby lith films were getting to be about 10 feet square. Uh, they were water sensitive, they would sag. Uh, the reduction cameras had a lot of distortion and people just couldn't control the overlay as things shrank. So we made this machine called a pattern generator and uh, to take the CAD data and create masks directly. And it had been built, but it wasn't working. And so I spent a year getting a thousandth of an inch out of the error budget. And in that process, I really learned systems engineering. My background's physics. So I learned machine design, and I learned how to do a real error budget and how to grind out 25 microns out of an error budget. And uh, that, that turns out to be a good discipline if you're in, a, in this kind of machinery business. Okay. And then, uh, so you mentioned the overlay. So that was uh, one of the critical factors that uh, drove the lithography at the time. Yeah, we, we, uh, we took the, Hewlett Packard had come up with this uh, heterodyne interferometer. And we put that on the uh, stage for the mask repeater. And we showed it here in the Hall of Flowers that Art mentioned. I think that year maybe we filled the Hall of Flowers, but it was early in the Semicon days. Um, and that gave us a very precise stage. The brochure we put together showed that we could image masks big enough for, I think, a five-inch wafer. Anyway, it had a six-inch mask on it. And Morris Chang at TI thought we had a step and repeat for directly imaging on the wafer. Uh, so that's another fortuitous accident. We had been thinking about that, and we actually had an internal roadmap uh, to show how we could do that, but we needed to add alignment capability. Photo masks, the machinery had to basically operate by dead reckoning, uh, and so it had to be very stable machinery, very precise, but there was no realignment, there was no servo control to make one mask match another. And we added a uh, video system and a microscope, mounted it on the uh, main projection system, so that you could align a wafer. And we put a TV system on that so you could operate it from outside to clean the chamber that we put around the machine. Um, so then we had a precise stage with laser metering and we had a good alignment system. Uh, and I've just recently found out from Bernie Roman that what really appealed to Motorola was the alignment. I always thought it was the resolution. Uh, but it turns out that the man company skill in precision machinery and very good control uh, was what they were after. Uh, what about the, the business aspects once the stepper came, came about? It, it was a very successful for GCA. Yeah, well, it, it initially wasn't, it wasn't that clear it was going to be a big business hit. Uh, the machine was only 10 wafers an hour, it was very slow. And the wafer tracks, GCA had bought IMS, Art Lashes company, so the tracks were at 60 wafers an hour. Uh, it wasn't obvious that the stepper was going to catch on. And we actually had some internal debates for a year or two about where to place our very small R&D money. And we could have built a completely automated photo repeater one year, or we could improve this uh, wafer stepper. And fortunately, we chose the latter, and we put the money into improving the wafer st stepper, basically to make it faster. We introduced it in 1978. Uh, we had a parade of people. Uh, we didn't know what to make of it. And, and then Motorola ordered 12 systems. And suddenly we had to go from building one machine a month to it ended up one a day. And the company went from about 125 people to 3,000 people as employees. That doesn't count turnover. Uh, GCA has become the fair child of the equipment business. I call that cadre of ex-GCA people the GCA mafia. And we're everywhere. so. <laughs> And a lot of key people, like Art Zafiropoulos, uh, came out of GCA in that era. Um, and I would say, we, my sense is, a lot of people have wondered, 
why did GCA then flounder in about in the recession of 84 was kind of the, the turning point, I'd say, uh, the recession in this business. And my take was we were a vertically oriented, uh, integrated company, which is sort of a pre-World War II kind of way of organizing your company. And as we grew from 300 people to 3,000, uh, we ran out of leadership. We didn't know it, of course. You hire somebody that's allegedly a skilled leader, it takes you six months to a year to find out that they're screwing up, and then you have to fix that. Uh, and uh, when you grow very quickly, it's easy to hire several people that screw up. And uh, pretty soon we lost, I'd say we lost the formula. The man company was known for very reliable machinery. It just ran day and night. And I worked very hard as a young engineer to build that into the pattern generator. It took several years to track down all the little intermittent failures. And we built, worked very hard to build that into the initial wafer steppers. Um, and those early machines ran like a Swiss clock. But as we grew, the quality of the product degenerated very quickly. The early GCA machine was also fairly large compared to machines that were being developed out here in the Bay Area. And uh, so the US market, and it was fairly expensive compared to a micro line, I think was around 100,000 at that point. And we were asking for almost 300,000. And I think our president raised the price over 500,000 when we sold out two and a half years of production. Um, so it was high priced. And the US manufacturers really weren't interested. And one of the uh, techno technical people at NEC said to me, Griff, we've taken apart the Motorola DRAM and we see the GCA alignment marks on every chip and so we know that's the right way to go. And so the Japanese DRAM makers were really the fir first high volume buyers. Um, one of the things I did was I put the track together with the stepper. We got the throughput up to maybe 30 wafers an hour, so it's still not a great deal. Uh, but I, I saw walking around fabs that there were a lot of wafers just sitting in plastic boxes waiting to be processed. And I knew from other work I'd done that that's typically uh, typical of a batch process manufacturing operation, that the material's often just sitting, it's work in process, it's not getting worked on. The tools are working maybe 2% of the time, of the cycle time, in a 30-day cycle time. So I had the idea that if you put the track and the, and the stepper together, you could not only deal with some of the whip, but I was convinced the wafers were getting dirty in those little plastic boxes, and that we could make a big improvement in yield, and that would pay for the mismatch in the, uh, line balance. Mitsubishi was actually the first one to buy that. I couldn't get anybody in the US to buy it. And their yields, yields in those days were about 20, 25%, not in the high 90s. And their yield went up 30, went up 10 percentage points from like 25 to 35. Of course, the customer will never tell you exactly what their yield is, but. Um, so I was right about not only the whip, but the particles. But again, it was the Japanese that were more aggressive. Uh, I've always puzzled over that. Anything on the technology side that's worth mentioning, mentioning that really was critical factors of, uh, of really emerging of the, of the stepper that really made the breakthroughs that get the Motorola to buy it and uh, the Japanese interested in? Well, Jerry's kind of mentioned this. There was this switch to positive photoresist. And one of the things that's not often discussed is uh, Bill Toby went out and hired a guy named Rick Rudell. And Rick had gone around the world teaching people how to convert from negative to positive resist for the reasons Jerry gave uh, and better resolution. And Bill hired Rick away from Perk and Elmer and got him to come join the GCA team. And I felt that was always symbolic. Um, of course, micro lines were running well over 60 wafers an hour, uh, but they weren't real clean and the alignment didn't work real well, which we found out later. Um, so I think that gaining applications know-how um, much like Peter was saying, in the early days, we had no idea what people in this room were doing with these tools. We knew how to put them together. And I think this industry had to learn about uh, understanding applications know-how. 